folks, should a business, a Christian business, be persecuted, be punished, be shut out and excluded from operating somewhere simply because it supports Christian causes and and donates to Christian organizations? Well, that's the question we're facing right now in the city of San Jose at the San Jose airport. We're going to talk about that in a very important regarding a very important case matter in the second half of the show. For the first half of the show, I want to interview one of our attorneys uh, dealing with something very important. Those of you who get our Legal Insider newsletter have been watching this uh, recently very closely. It's involving not just a grandma, it's involving a great grandma who was booted out of an apartment complex because of her Christian faith, uh, because of her sharing her Christian faith here in the United States of America. Well, we're going to talk about that right now with one of our attorneys. Uh, Matt McReynolds. Matt, are you there? I'm here. Thanks for having me on today, Brad. Oh, it's great to have you on, Matt. Uh, tell us about this case. Uh, what, what, what? Give us the factual background so people who haven't heard of this case can uh, really understand what we're talking about. Yeah, well, Brad, this has become a disturbing trend. At the Pacific Justice Institute has observed over the last um, few years where the elderly in a number of different situations now have had their Bible studies restricted, have had their worship services shut down, and in this case, have even been evicted from their apartments. And this was a lady uh, whose son actually reached out to us after hearing about another situation we've talked about on the show here um, in in the California Veterans Home. We've talked about the great-grandmother there who was threatened with eviction. And he heard us, he heard about Pacific Justice's work on that, and he said, you know what, this is a lot like what has happened to my mom in Central California. And so he reached out to us and let us know that his mom, in uh, just below the city of Fresno, Central California, city of Hanford, uh, had actually been evicted from her apartment. And so as we looked into this, we found out you know, there was, was documentation of this. It was, it was clear. Not only did she been evicted for religious reasons, the landlord had talked to her about her age and even suggested um, that some mental instability was a basis for her eviction. But in looking at the documents, it was clear right on their face that not even enough notice was given for the eviction. So there were just a number of concerning things here. Yeah, her lease has, hadn't even expired. <laughs> so she was uh, still within the lease to be there. Uh, I understand when, you know, when she communicated, hey, look, you know, I don't have anywhere to go. I don't have, you know, family here in town. Uh, it was just like, I don't care. I mean, it was a real callous uh, representation, a, a real callous uh, demeanor that, that seemed to be, at least by her perception, uh, conveyed by uh, the owners. And uh, that's really disturbing. We see someone who's discriminated apparently because of her, her age uh, and also because of the fact that she shares and lives her Christian faith. She prays with people. Uh, I would not, if I was a landlord, Matt, if I, if I had an uh, apartment complex, uh, that's the kind of people I'd like to have. I'd like to have people who had a good attitude, who uh, loved the Lord, who, who, who prayed. Uh, but I wouldn't discriminate uh, against people because of their faith. I wouldn't discriminate because of their age, because the law is very clear on that, isn't it? Uh, oh, it absolutely is, Brad. But do you know what's, what else is disturbing about this is that uh, this family had previously reached out to another lawyer here in California who told them that they didn't have a case. Oh. And, and thank goodness that they eventually heard about Pacific Justice, heard about the work we were doing on a similar case, and because when it came across our desk, we immediately recognized the religious discrimination that was at work. I mean, this was, as you alluded to, um, a lady. I've spoken with her on a number of occasions now. Just a just a delightful older lady in her mid 80s who loves to share with people about her faith. She shares with the repairman who comes to work on her TV. She offers to pray for people around the complex, um, and yet this. She was evicted from her apartment. Yeah, it, it's a real sad story. And unfortunately, we, we've seen this before. And the good news is that, number one, uh, wherever you are in the United States, 
uh, if this happens to you, uh, there's protection. Uh, there's legal protection for you. And number two, we at the Pacific Justice Institute have affiliate attorneys all across the United States uh, to go to bat for you. We have a, also a, a full-time office in Seattle, Washington, another full-time office in Salem, Oregon, other full-time offices up and down California, and as well as affiliate attorneys all across the United States. So if you're in this situation or you know of someone who is, contact us for help. Also, I want to thank the radio stations out there, folks, because those radio stations out there that carry the Dacus Report uh, or our commentary, The Legal Insider, which is Monday through Friday, a short commentary, 30 or 60 seconds, uh, that is literally the lifeline that enables us to help people out there. Uh, like this, this uh, elderly woman who needed help. Uh, they heard about this. It's often you know, through the radio pro- broadcasts that literally serve as a lifeline to those communities. So thank you so much for those out- of you out there who are carrying this program. Uh, I know there's a, a large number. I think last we heard was about 170 plus stations across the country just carrying the Dacus Report. And thank you from the bottom of our hearts for us to be able to help people like this who hear about our cases and then know to contact us. Now, Matt, uh, we did get involved in this case. Uh, what happened? What what steps did we at the Pacific Justice Institute take uh, after we were contacted? Uh, well, the first thing we did, Brad, was we very quickly fired off a demand letter to the landlord laying out the laws that had been violated and uh, basically putting it to him. What was he going to do to remedy that? Uh, we did get a, a, initially a quick response from him trying to um, settle the case, uh, but then settlement negotiations stalled. Uh, you know, mm. he seemed to think that maybe we would just go away over time, and that certainly wasn't going to happen. So we then filed uh, an official charge of discrimination with the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing. We mm. let them know that we had every indication of taking it uh, every intention of taking it as far as it needed to go. And uh, fortunately, that was the catalyst, along with uh, some publicity uh, via Fox News and some other um, outlets that work with us on these kinds of cases to help spread the word about it. And that is what really brought them to the negotiating table. And I'm, I'm very happy to say within uh, just the last few days, we've been able to resolve this. We reached a, a great settlement that... Um, made our, our client very happy, and, and also included um, a, a heartfelt apology, which we rarely see in these kinds of, of situations from the landlord, and a number of changes that he's going to implement at that apartment complex to make sure this doesn't happen to anyone else there. Yeah, the irony here is that this landlord is not just the average landlord either. He's actually a, a local politician, local public official uh, there in that community, and I, I think that uh, the media coverage definitely played a role as an incentive in dealing with it from not only a legal perspective, but also from a public relations uh, perspective as well. And uh, we at Pacific Justice Institute, as you know, Matt, uh, have used the media very effectively at times in help getting out that information. I know I had a case in Texas dealing with a street preacher who was being criminally prosecuted and it was nine months had gone by and this was going to trial and in just a couple of weeks. And so I went ahead and I contacted the assistant DA and I said, look, uh, I just want to let you know as a matter of professional courtesy that we're going to be having a major press conference on this. Uh, but I, you know, by no means would I want to have a press conference on this in any way, give a, the district attorney's office a black eye. Uh, if in fact you guys are going to be dropping the charges. So I wanted to, as a matter of professional courtesy, let you know of our plans and to find out if, in fact, you're planning on dropping the charges. And in two days, they dropped the charges. I didn't have to fly out there to, to have this criminal defense case where a pastor was going to be put behind bars for up to a year for preaching the gospel. And using the media, we've discovered, can be very effective, and I know it was definitely effective in this case. Matt, um, any uh, words of, of wisdom that you have? I mean, this was a great settlement. We can't talk about uh, the, the actual dollar amount of the settlement or the, the, the other terms of the settlement. We, we, it was very, very beneficial, not only to our client, but also to people in the future in that apartment complex. What, what advice do you give someone who is in a similar situation? They feel like they're being you know, treated adversely, you know, not because they're loud and noisy, uh, <laughs> because some people need to turn down their stereos, but 
they're being treated adversely because uh, the fact that they're sharing their faith, living their faith, and they're in an apartment complex. Uh, they, are, they do have rights, uh, correct? And what should they do? How do they know what their rights are? Absolutely. Yeah, we, we want everybody listening to us to be very connected to our website at pji.org so that they can get in touch with us right away when they hear about something like this. Uh, you know, Brad, uh, there was a mixed blessing here because it, it was unfortunate that we didn't hear about this situation right away uh, before our client actually did move out and was evicted mm. from her apartment. You know, thankfully she was able to find somewhere that has turned out to be a better situation uh, for her in a lot of ways. But if we had known, if we had heard about it at the outset, you know, I, I think uh, we would have been able to keep her there and to prevent the eviction from happening. So the sooner that we hear about situations like this, the sooner we're able to act and able to prevent uh, things like that. Yes. And folks, if you're listening to this broadcast, I encourage you to go to our website uh, sign up to get our Legal Insider newsletter, and then pass it on. Uh, you are one of the, the, the biggest ambassadors we have to, uh, to making sure people know that we're here to help them. It's by you passing on this information uh, you know, verbally, as well as uh, through Facebook, through the internet. Uh, so we greatly appreciate those of you who are part of our team by signing up to get our information. Uh, of course, supporting our work is always appreciated, both prayerfully and financially. And then also sending out this information so that people like this, like this grandma uh, can be helped uh, because people can know that we're here to help them and to serve them without charge, thanks to support from many people out there just like you. Matt, thank you for the great work you're doing, and uh, you and the Office of Sacramento keep up the great work. Thanks, Brad. a passion, I guess, to share with those who don't know the Lord because somebody loved me enough to share with me. And where would I be if they hadn't been willing to put up with my prickliness? And I've known Iris ever since I got here, and I love her Bible study. She's a very good teacher. She teaches the Word of, of God. I was just wandering around on a Saturday afternoon looking for something to do and I heard some people talking and I went over to the lounge and they were having a Bible study. It was like connecting all the dots. Artists would tell us a story and then find it in the Bible and it seemed to make such common sense. I should take a a topic and we discuss the topic at, at its various levels and to try to make sense of that topic. He was arguing with the artists, and, uh, more of the artists than me, about accepting the Lord and he was a skeptic and I don't know just what all. But then one day he had an accident downstairs and he, he fell down and uh, I don't know, it broke his hip or something. He, uh, she was talking about uh, uh, you know, get off the fence. Well, he said, I jumped the fence. And he did. He jumped the fence and asked the Lord in his life. And we would, we'd been working with him. I would have gave up. Artist is more persistent. I have to hand it to her. I was stripped of chaplaincy, of being a volunteer, of being able to teach the Bible study and of my TV program. One of the accusations is that I was rude. I'm not rude by nature. I am sure that God wants me to ask you where you're going to go. But that's not up to me. We are all under a death penalty because we have broken God's laws. God put me in the business of helping people find him. This is a very special place that 
talks about the the cost of freedom. It's not free. We have to continuously understand that if we want to be free, if we want to exercise our God-given rights and our constitutional rights, it's going to cost us. And that's probably why I fight. Because as a Jew, I knew that Yeshua, Jesus, was not a subject, and it was going to cost me everything. Maybe not my life, but everything that I counted important in my life. Uh, Artist Bro is one of the most uh, vivacious um, great-grandmas that you're ever likely to meet. Uh, she's, she's full of life. She's a light in a dark place. And in a place where that vivacity, that spirit is so desperately needed. And sadly, the Veterans Home is pursuing her uh, precisely because of that reason, because she's the type of person who has strong beliefs and isn't afraid to say them. She's the kind of person who will stand up for herself and stand up for other people as well. Artis is a woman who just loves the Lord and she wants us to share her faith, the hope that's within her. These veterans at this home, they, they sacrificed uh, so this Bible study could happen. All veterans deserve to be protected, uh, to not have to relinquish their constitutional rights, that they work so hard and sacrifice so much to defend. And that's why we, we, can't, we can't let this go by. Uh, we all need to stand up. We all need to, to say enough is enough and it's okay uh, to share her faith, to share the good news at that home. And folks, if you'd like to support the Pacific Justice Institute, you don't want to be on the sidelines anymore. You actually want to become a part of our team. It's easy to do that. Just go to our website, pji.org. P for Pacific, J for Justice, I for Institute.org. And there you can sign up to be a one-time or a monthly supporter. We greatly appreciate that. We do all of our work without charge. So your financial support is very, very much appreciated. Uh, our attorneys on the front line, uh, they never forget by God's grace where their ammunition comes from. And it's from people like you that believe in what we're doing and want to help what we're doing and the people that we're representing across the country without charge. Also, you can sign up to get our Legal Insider newsletter. Folks, this is so important. You know, we want to be watchful in all things. We want to be aware of what's going on so we can at the very least pray for it and, and let people know about it and pass it on. Well, that's what the Legal Insider enables you to do. It empowers you to do this, and it's so valuable. It's once a week. It's short. And I'm going to tell you another reason why it's important. Right now, we have a lot of censorship that's taking place, not in isolated ways, but it's in, on a, in a broad scales. We're seeing it take place on a number of social media where they're censoring uh, programs like, like our pro, uh, information uh, and information similar to ours uh, is being censored by social media. So... There's always that possibility that we could be uh, taken off the air. You may not have exposure to us in the future. Uh, this is a real threat, and we need to talk to our, our congressmen, let them know about this, encourage them uh, to take action as, as is appropriate, as, as is needed to preserve our free speech rights as a society. But also, you need to be aware of this because if we're taken off the air, the legal insider could be literally the only way you could find out about the case that we're doing. We handle more cases on the West Coast alone than any other organization of our kind, period. So it's what we're doing is very important. And we have affiliate attorneys all across the United States taking on cases and matters that you won't hear about in the news media, but are very, very important. So go to our website, pji.org, sign up to get our Legal Insider newsletter and pass it on to others. And of course, thank you so much for those of you who also choose to become a part of our financial team support our work on either a one-time or a monthly basis. Now, 
to talk about a real important case matter we're dealing with right now in the city of San Jose, California. We have with us on the line uh, Dennis Feigl. Dennis, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me again. Now, Dennis, you head up our office there in San Jose. I appreciate the work that you're doing. Uh, needless to say, the San Francisco Bay Area keeps us very busy. And there's something that's taken place specifically recently in, in San Jose at the airport. Uh, what's going on uh, with regards to this mistreatment of a wonderful business? And why are they being persecuted? Well, uh, the, the very popular restaurant Chick-fil-A has a contract, uh, a concessions contract at the San, San Jose airport. And their uh, contract originally goes until 2026. And last year, uh, they considered extending that for an additional two years to 2028. And that was denied for uh, very odd and unfair reasons. Okay. What were, I mean, I love Chick-fil-A. Okay. I mean, I, I, it's, it's, it's really good. And I like the, 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 the grilled chicken sandwiches, you know, the healthy, and I like the unhealthy ones and the deep fried and then the shakes are awesome. I mean, it's really, really good food. They're very friendly. As I say, it's the friendliest fast food franchise I've ever experienced. You know, why are they under attack? What's going on? So at the city council meeting where they, uh, decided on whether to extend the two-year contract. An active, a, a number of activists were present at the meeting, and they spoke out, and they urged the council to deny Chick-fil-A from, from being at the airport because they deem Chick-fil-A as a, quote, hate group, or a symbol of hate, I should say, sorry. Really, a symbol of hate. Uh, yeah. They're very benevolent. I mean, this organization... Uh, reaches out to the community. I think In-N-Out Burger and Chick-fil-A are probably the most engaging in their community of any nonprofit organizations that I'm aware of with uh, love and benevolence. Uh, they also support uh, charity organizations. They go out of their way to uh, to give to wonderful uh, charities like uh, Salvation Army and to, to, to just uh, to name one. I mean, how can they be called a, a you know, a symbol of hatred? I, I, I don't get it. I don't understand it myself. Presumably, this is uh, because Chick-fil-A's founder, you know, has famously spoken out about his uh, deeply held uh, religious beliefs regarding marriage. Uh, the uh, activists at the city council meeting were LGBTQ uh, advocates. And uh, it's unfortunate because they were very influential. The city council when it came time to vote, voted unanimously, 11 to 0, to withhold the two-year extension from, and the way they put it is they, they are withholding the two-year extension from any operator that does not operate seven days per week at the airport. Okay, so that was that was the, the cover, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, because Chick-fil-A believes, you know, their, their owners and founder believe strongly in uh, honoring the Sabbath, keeping it holy. And having it not all open on Sundays. I remember when I used to live in, in Texas, and on Sundays you had all these stores that were closed on Sunday uh, because it's Sundays, you know, the the day that Christians recognize as the Sabbath, and uh, and it's the and it's the day for for pam families to spend time together, to spend time at, to go to church. So their position is not abnormal. Uh, it's actually very historical. And yet, uh, that is the, the pretext, if you will, that was given for shutting them down. But the, but the real issue, I mean, they were approved before. So the real issue right. that caused us to be, come to the surface were uh, activists, uh, LGBTQ activists, uh, acting, I will say, out of hatred, uh, not tolerance. Because if they're engaging in tolerance, they say, okay, we respect the right that this organization, that this founder is a Christian is a Christian biblical worldview. Uh, but no, because he is a Christian, because he has a Christian biblical worldview, because they support charities like Salvation Army, they have a Christian biblical worldview, including on regarding marriage, because the Bible is very, very clear on this. So if you're a Christian, you believe the Bible is the word of God, you're the enemy of this organization. And if you have a business, they're going to do everything they can to intimidate you, silence you, and destroy you. And this is a just a clear, blatant manifestation of that dangerous, radical agenda 
that we see being implemented uh, by the these kind of LGBTQ radicals. And it's you know they say that that uh, <laughs> that Chick Fil A is a, a hate icon or a hate symbol. I mean that the only hatred I see, folks, is is from intolerant LGBTQ members. They're the ones who are trying to silence. Ask yourself this: If someone's a hate group, ask yourself: uh, Are they trying to to silence? Or are they trying to uh, give for freedom of expression? Are they trying to uh, to shut someone down? Or are they trying to let uh, free enterprise flourish and individuals uh, practice their their business? That to me is a, is how you decide who is truly of hatred and a hate group. And the LGBTQ radicals fit that definition. Clear as crystal. Now, enough of my uh, tirade there, <laughs> uh, Dennis. So we heard about this. What are we at Pacific Justice Institute? Uh, what are we doing? I know we're not representing Chick Fil A in a legal capacity, but we're not being remaining silent. What are we doing? Right. So we've been asked by a uh, a group called the Value Value Advocacy Council, who was similarly outraged by what's happening here, and and PJI was asked to write a letter. Uh, a, a legal opinion letter to the city council uh, explaining what's going on and, 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 and show them that this is actually uh, discriminating against a Christian organization. And, and frankly, it violates federal law for them to be treated this way. So legally speaking, in terms of, of federal law, if someone is facing this as a business anywhere in the United States, they should not hesitate to contact us at Pacific Justice Institute. And the fact is, uh, we've seen these kinds of businesses, you know, attacked simply because they have a Christian biblical worldview, not because they actually hate anyone, but simply because they have a Christian biblical worldview. And what you're telling me, and I think the audience needs to, the audience needs to understand this, is that under federal law, there is a remedy of protection for business owners like this, like the owners of Chick-fil-A, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, What's frustrating here, too, is that neither the advocates nor the, the city provided one ounce of evidence that Chick-fil-A is hateful, that they discriminate any of their customers or employees based on, on anything, really, much less uh, sexual preference, sexual identity, or, right. or uh, sexual orientation. So it's, it, all they did was label them as a symbol of hate, and 11 to 0, they, they act and to, make, to add injury or insult to injury. What the uh, council agreed to do is allow the airport to display rainbow flags and transgender flags in close proximity to the restaurant to um, combat any perceptions that might arise from Chick-fil-A's presence in the airport. Wow. And, and that, to me, is just outrageous. It, it is, because what, what, what about just tolerance? I mean, <laughs> what about just simply tolerating businesses like this? I, I tell you, Dennis, I think that if we allow businesses like Chick-fil-A to be treated like this down the road and they get away with it, these, these LGBTQ radicals are not going to stop the, their, their hatred just against businesses. I think they're going to start, they're going to apply it against churches because churches, like the owner of Chick-fil-A, they believe they have a Christian message. They teach what the Bible teaches about, about sin. All have sinned, all have fallen short of God's glory and righteousness and are deserving of the penalty of death. And that's why... Jesus died on a cross because we're all sinners, and and it's not because we we can't cut out sins and say well, we don't we think this sin is is okay that sin's okay. Christianity is all about recognizing sin and recognizing our need for a savior, and that's what churches teach. So I think that down the road, uh, we could easily see these these uh, attacks to destroy and to shut down not just levied against businesses but also against uh, churches and uh, Orthodox synagogues and, and others of, of faith. So I think this is a very important case matter, and we can see that if we're not successful, they can implement these kinds of attacks successfully against other business owners and businesses simply because of either their, their faith, their convictions, or because of the wonderful uh, charities that they support doing great work in accordance with their faith. So, Dennis, thank you so much for what you're doing. And, uh, folks, I want people to be praying for Dennis and uh, the work that he's doing in this matter and other matters there in the San Francisco Bay Area. God bless you, Dennis, and keep up the great work. Thanks so much, Brad. Take care. So, folks, there you have it. It's our God-given freedoms we're talking about. Now, let's choose to keep them. I'm Brad Dacus, president of the Pacific Justice Institute. Have a great weekend.